So I wanted to introduce Dave. I'm Bill Hurd. I'm from uh, part two of Commodore, which I like to think of as a Greek tragedy in three acts. <laughs> Here's our third act, uh, Dave coming. The reason I wanted to introduce him is I was the first person Dave met from CVM, and I was also the first person to know he was about to be hired by CVM. <laughs> so the, what, it, what we used to do back then is we would go to, you'd work all day, work hard, and then go to the headhunters until about 10 at night, and they would just run all these people by us. So on one night, we and my boss, Joe Krizuki, go there. They were putting him in the back, and I'm sitting out front in the waiting room. And in bops this guy. And I mean, he had diddle bopped in the door. He had all this youthful energy, hadn't burned him out yet and everything. And he's wearing a homemade shirt. So you figure anybody that makes his own shirt probably knows how to solder, too. So he sits down next to me. He's still, you here for the job? And I'm like, something like that. That's exactly what I said. So then I'm like, I've got the magazine upside down or something. I'm like, so where are you working now? And he's, oh, I'm GE. So why are you quitting? Oh, I don't like killing people. I'm writing missile code. Well, if somebody said that to you in an interview, you'd be like, really? But he's telling me this in the front lobby of, of a headhunter. So the, um, uh, at some point, he goes in and gets interviewed. And then he comes in to interview with me, and the look on his face is priceless as the long-haired guy <laughs> sitting there said, we met. Well, yes. <laughs> so the one thing about Dave, see, I'm a self-taught guy, STV repairman and everything. I'm really bad at math. I'm from Indiana. We don't do math in Indiana. And so what I needed was somebody that could do the things I couldn't do. So the final test I had for Dave was I said, uh, you know, can you do a Laplace transform? And this guy grabs a pencil and starts to do one which is a good Commodore attitude, yeah? So I grabbed the pencil out of his hand, and I didn't mean now, but I knew he had been fired. So I give you, ladies and gentlemen, the third act of a Greek tragedy, Commodore Part Three: What's Dead May Never Die. <laughs> So, yeah, Greek tragedy. Well, it was uh, summer of 80, 80, 86 or so. I was, Bill, Bill was leaving if he hadn't left yet. I was trying to figure out how I was going to justify not also getting fired because there, there have been rounds of layoffs. Commodore was a little sketchy at that point. Um, they would spent a lot of money buying Amiga. Uh, we hadn't seen any of that yet. So um, I, I was working with Frank Pelea to on a couple dog and pony things, trying to figure out if there's any life left in 8-bit. And we had created a, uh, there, there was, actually Bill knew about this. There was an MMU that he wasn't allowed to use that, was, uh, that could actually support 256. So we did a, I did a quick C256 hack of a regular C128. We got uh, Freddy to support it in software um, and then we had a different model that Frank worked on that made the Z80 go full speed. And we were proposing this as maybe something, and they weren't, they, no, management really didn't know what they were doing at that point. They, they had no idea. But um, so in parallel with all of this stuff, with Amiga getting acquired, there had been this other project called the Commodore 900, or as we called it, the Z8000 project. And there had been two different teams that really didn't get anywhere on it. But the third team actually kind of did. Um, that was George Robbins and Bob Welland and a few other people, a few software people. And the Commodore 900 had been Commodore's answer to essentially what the Amiga was. It's a higher level machine, 16-bit computer. This one was running an operating system called Coherent from a company called Mark Williams that was a Unix clone. And these were all Unix guys. And the Commodore 900 also had a, uh, it had a graphics, uh, megapixel graphics, that black and white screen that, that um, was running with a bit blitter chip that Bob Wellen had designed, and at least architected. And um, it, was, it was kind of a cool computer. It had, it had a windowing system written by this guy, Rico Tudor, that was just wicked fast. It really, really didn't do much but let you have a bunch of different shells on the screen. It wasn't, it wasn't a full graphics environment, but it was wicked fast. And of course, because of the Amiga and Commodore's problems, the Commodore 900, which had been in development for years and finally got working, was canceled. 
So these guys had to figure out what to do. So they decided they were going to take on the Amiga. And they, so the Amiga 1000 was a little expensive to make because you had, you had a, lot of, a lot of stuff. You had this, um, you had this Agnes chip and all these buffers around it and all these PALs to control the buffers because the chips themselves weren't fast enough to control the buffers. And it made it kind of an expensive system and kind of complicated. And the, these guys decided, hey, we can do better than that. And they came up with the Fat Agnes concept. And that was going to suck all that stuff into a bigger chip. As the biggest chip commoner could make at the time, 84 pins. Whoa. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and so the people out in, people out in Los Gatos didn't think that was possible. It's not going to work. And in fact, they, they weren't even 100% sure it was going to work. All the timing said it should, but they were, they were being very cautious. So they actually had a separate pros project where they had the fat chip, which was just the fat that you could put next to regular Agnes. And, but the fat Agnes worked. And so before you knew it, George and Bob were working on the Amiga 500. And I didn't really have anything to do. So in August of 86, they said, Dave, you're, you're the low-end guy. Come and look at this computer that George has created, and you, you should probably take this over and let George go, and we're going to be taking over a project. So the German group, we had, a, we had an engineering, a smaller engineering group in Braunschweig, and they had, they had decided, they had been working with um, some of our PC people to say we should build this Amiga that can run, that, that can expand to allow IBM stuff to run in it as well. And none of us were crazy about that idea, but they, they had this whole Amiga 500 concept, only they had really just taken the, uh, the, the A, A1000 design and they had taken a, some, of this, some of the schematics that had been published um, for, uh, for building backplanes, building Zorro backplanes, and they put them together in this box. And it wasn't, it wasn't terribly well thought out, but it worked. And then they had, they, but they wanted more memory, so they had this really bad expansion memory that they had put a slot in there, in there that was um, really just for this expansion memory. It was identical to the edge on the Amiga 1000, and um, so we were going to be taking that over. So I was, you know, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll go in there, and I worked on the Amiga 500 for about a month, and it became pretty clear quickly that George just wasn't going to let that go because that was his baby, and he, he, and, and so they put me on the A500. So all of a sudden. I moved to being like, you know, I'm at like 23 years old. I'm like the high-end guy now. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I guess maybe I was 24 by then. But anyway, it was um, so I'm doing this high-end Amiga 500, and really, I was just following the A500. I mean, the, the Amiga 2000. I was following the A500. I was saying, okay, well, let's see what they do. And every, George, whatever George did, I did about a month later on the A12, on the A2000. But there was some other stuff. So, okay, so they had put. They put a, a lot of internal slots to match the connectors on the Amiga 1000. So there's the slot for the for the extra memory card. And I said, that's kind of stupid. We don't need that because I'm going to put a whole megabyte on the motherboard um, because you can do that with Fat Agnes. So I put a. Uh, I decided that the, the one thing that was really catching on for the Amiga 1000 at the time was that people were putting CPU cards on the side. So I said, okay, we're going to we're going to turn this memory slot into a CPU slot. And it, we'd already decided that, again, with, with the expansion bus, that was a bunch of buffers and a bunch of PALs. And I wanted to at least get some of that stuff into, into a Gatorade, into a custom chip, to make the cost go down and, to, and also make it just, it's, PALs are bad because you have to program them in, in production. So there's, they're actually more expensive than you think they are because you have to have somebody putting the code into them. Or you have to buy them with the company putting the code in it, which means you, you don't get the volume discounts that you want. So, and we were very, very sensitive about price of Commodore always because we wanted to be cheaper than everybody else and better in every possible way, and you know it worked out. But <laughs> so anyway, um, let's see. So I was working on the uh, this, and I, I had decided that we should we should have the whole video bus, not just the, the this video slot they put in there was really just the Genlock slot. It was the same as the 23 pin connector on the back of the machine, and so I looked at it and said. It got it. We got to bring out the rest of the. the we had this whole 12-bit video bus, which doesn't sound like much, but it's better than the. There, there were four digital bits that went to that, and then all the analog stuff. And I, you know, I was asking, you know, I was talking to George about. It. He says, "Why don't we put the parallel? Why don't we put some other stuff there? Parallel port or something, so we can control whatever goes in there." So we just kind of cooked this up and um, put a second connector in there, and we filled. 
that second connector with the rest of the digital video and all the signals that could go there. And we didn't really know what you were going to use it for, but we figured it was, it was probably a good idea. And so that was the, that was the Amiga 2000. Um, a little bit after that, um, Bob Welland was still trying to get Unix on some kind of computer from Commodore. He had come up with, a, uh, with an add-in card. We, were, we had actually been discussing this because of this whole CPU slot thing. He was working on a CPU, and he had come up with a card that had a, a, a 68,020 on it, which was a big upgrade from the 68,000. It was full 32-bit. This card could have four megabytes of 32-bit of wide memory that would go really fast. And it actually had an MMU on it, so you could run Unix, because that was his his evil plan was to run Unix. Um, and that that he's having trouble getting it to work. So I, I when the, when the A two thousand was done, this is this is like eighty seven or so. Um, I, I started getting into that, and it turned out that I was getting into it because Bob was leaving. And he he was he left us for Apple. Uh, he was actually one of the guy one of the main guys behind the Newton. <laughs> What kind of Unix was it? Um, this was this this was it was before System Five release four. So you had I guess it was System Five release three or five. Okay. It was System Five, and you had to um, you, you we called it Amix because of course you weren't allowed to say Unix back then, and it ran the Rico Windows. You know, it ran this really fast Rico Windows system, and it could, you could actually run Unix. In, uh, on, a, on a two megabyte system, but if you wanted to run Emacs, you had to run four megabytes. I remember that because it was constantly swapping. It basically just thrashed the hard disk running Unix in two megabytes. <laughs> um, and another another cut, and, and so that was, that the 2620 got working, and again, it was one of those like, okay, what do you do next? Well, um, now, you know, Commodore for a long, you know, for many, many years, we'd kind of been, We'd been put, we hadn't really been pushing that many envelopes. I mean, the 8-bit stuff, we, we made our own 8-bit chips, but they were, you know, they, you know, they were, they were, we were doing interesting things with them. The MMU was probably, that was, the C128 was probably the best 8-bit system that ever went out. Um, it was way more flexible than just about anybody else's, but um, I got a call from, I got a, you know, actually, you know, Jeff Porter wandered over one day and said, Jeff Porter was our, was our director of engineering and basically the guy, who kept everything going and kept all the all the com all the corporate nonsense away from us, so we could actually concentrate on making stuff. And he came by and said, "You know, Motorola told me they're going to send us a 68,030, which is this brand new chip that had the MMU built in, so you didn't have to add the second part and figure out all these all these double bus arbitration systems and everything. And you know, we're going to have this in about a month, and that's all he told me. And within a week, I had." Redesigned the the, the twenty six twenty to um, support um, a, the twenty the sixty eight thousand thirty. But the other thing was that the critical thing here was that the the twenty six twenty got its clock from the the Amiga two thousand and it ran at fourteen megahertz because that you had two different seven megahertz clock that were phased differently and you run them through an exclusive OR gate and you get a fourteen megahertz clock and that was good but. It, I wanted to go faster, so I had I put a uh, I put a 25 megahertz clock on this and figured out how to synchronize the two buses so that um, it would go really fast. And talk to our, our, we everybody used we had this guy Terry Fisher who was like just the wizard of putting out circuit boards. So I was like Fish, you got I got this new chip. You take that old design and change all this stuff around and crank this out as quickly as possible. And when that 68,030 came in, um, I plugged it right in. On the other side of the board, because somehow the top and bottom of the 60,030 pinout was wrong. But fortunately, in the days of through-hole chips, you just put it on the other side of the circuit board, and uh, it would work. So that's what I did, and I had this. I had the 68,030 system, and probably several sleepless days later, judging by the number of jumpers I remember putting on that thing, um, it was up and running, and I put a label on it said world's fastest Amiga and went home and slept all weekend. And uh, then the next week I, I, had, I had come up with this memory system where um, the 68,030 also had this burst mode that was really cool. You could run, you could run a lot faster if you ran in burst mode. Uh, but you, had to get, you basically had to get memory going really fast. So I, I put a, uh, I, I had this memory interleave using the memory zone output buffers and 
made it go in burst mode, and then it was running like even I was just running all these dry stone benchmarks, and this went even faster than before. So I put a I put a um, sign on it that said even the, the world's even faster, Megan. Let that run for a while, and then I realized that the memory chips were actually kind of destroying themselves. They weren't really fast <laughs> enough to, to be run that way, so we didn't ship with that particular memory configuration, unfortunately. Um, if you stuck around long enough, you got a uh, you got a memory type called EDO, which actually did that correctly because you could you could turn off part of it, and they had it had a it had actually had a high higher speed buffer in it, and it also that buffer latched the data, so you could kind of start the next memory cycle. So I, a couple years later, it would have been possible, but it wasn't later wasn't possible then. Um, another interesting thing happened in the mid '80s, and that was um, there's this guy Headley Davis that we hired. And he, he was kind of a mad wizard. Um, he came up with this idea for, you know, Commodore, we, we were really always hoping that we were going to get better graphics chips. But, you know, the, the custom chips were really complicated. And you needed, you know, it costs a lot of money to make new custom chips. And Commodore wasn't much about giving money to engineering anyway. We did a lot with what we had. Um, probably got our best, best return on the money, on, on money spent for any company doing personal computers. But... Um, they didn't. They didn't. Um, they didn't spend enough money. So um, Headley had come up with this neat idea: of if you made a smart monitor with its own memory, and then just sent different parts of that image over the Amiga video, you could come up with a higher resolution. And it just turned out that that it all, if you, if you did things with the copper and everything, it all kind of worked because you could, it, it, with 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 the regular with the original chipset, you could have a screen up to 1,008 by 800 that could still blit. And if you got EC, if you got the ECS chips, you could actually go to 1,024. So Headley came up with this mo these monitors that did 2-bit that did color, or 2-bit grayscale. So it was black, dark gray, light gray, and white. Just so happened that we had, we had gotten one of these Next Cubes, because we were always, almost any time somebody came out with a computer, we'd get it in and take it apart. But the software guys liked the Next Cube so much because of the it had the nice big megapixel display with two bit grayscale um, that they wouldn't let anybody take it apart. They wouldn't let me anywhere near it. <laughs> um, I mean, I had taken apart the there was you know we had Radio Shack computers I took apart and part of it was just to steal their really good manufacturing ideas and part of it was to laugh at how bad they did stuff like they had capacitors hanging all over the place and blue wires and green wires and all this stuff in production units. You know, we weren't buying their prototypes. Um, you know, you got to feel superior in some way. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't our sales or our marketing department that made us feel superior. So, um, so uh, he had come up with this monitor. And pretty soon everybody, I got one on my desk. Um, all the software guys were getting these. And that's a lot of what drove the look of Amiga OS 2.0, was to look really good on the Headley high-res monitor and to steal some of the good ideas from, from what you saw in the next operating system. We didn't want, we didn't want it as big and heavy as it was, but, but um, so the other thing that, we, that the next didn't really inspire, but we were working towards that anyway. So um, around 1989, we started thinking about what's, you know, we really, you know, the, we had the Amiga 2000, we had the, the 2500 series, so, you know, we had the one with, you know, the one with the 020 in it, the one with the 030 in it. Um, but we wanted to go next generation. We got to, okay, now we got to build a real 32-bit computer. So we started on the, uh, on the Amiga, two th Amiga 3000, and, you know, you just sort of knew what the name was going to be. I mean, it wasn't that hard to add a 1,000. <laughs> um, but this was actually a big project. Rather than just, like, one or two guys, um, there was, uh, say, um, there was myself, Greg Berlin, Headley Davis, um, Scott Schaefer, who am I forgetting? Um, Jeff Boyer. And each of us had at least one chip to do. So I did the Buster chip. I knew about the expansion bus. I'd, I'd actually, in the summer of, in the summer of uh, 89, I, seeing that stuff was going to happen soon, and I'd been reading about the E-ISA bus, which is what the, what the IBM got, you know, IBM compatible people had come up with for um, how, do we, how do we expand the standard PCAT bus into something 32-bit. And I looked, and they came up with this double-level connector, and it got really complicated. And they still weren't doing auto config right. They had they had actually had a ROM on the or flash ROM or a, a e prom on the card that set the jumpers. It's like you guys are still like two generations behind. 
but I wanted to keep things compatible as much as possible. So I figured out how to basically put a 32-bit bus on top of the 16-bit signals that we had, 16 slash 24-bit signals that we had, and I made up this thing called the Zorro 3 bus. And the idea really was that I kind of looked at this as a, you know, a generational thing that we weren't really going to be able to do a great job of this for the Amiga, 2, for Amiga 3000, but in the future, we'd have an integrated chip, because again, we were, we were limited to 84-pin chips, because that was the best Commodore could do, and you couldn't fit a, a, a multiplex 32-bit bus in both directions going through that, so I still had a lot of buffers there, and, and I actually did have a PAL, but not like lots and lots of PALs. <laughs> I had to have something that sat on the expansion bus itself and did some memory decoding, um, but the concept worked out pretty well, and I, scrambled around to try to find anybody to look over the stuff I had come up with to make suggestions and it's really hard to get anybody to look at that stuff because nobody cared about the expansion bus except me but I got Headley Davis to look it over and he made some good good suggestions and and it, eventually we, we thumbed up that and we started working on the Amiga 3000 you and said, you said yeah. you, you were doing chips for these were you these yeah we were doing we were doing gate arrays we were design yeah we we're doing logic level design okay. It wasn't. It wasn't register transfer. It wasn't. It wasn't a high level language anymore. We were doing. We were doing. Um, all the systems guys were doing some sort of uh, gate array. Commodore had come up with the gate array process. We had. We originally had a thing called the channeled array, and then they switched to a sea of gates, which didn't work very well for a couple of years. Uh, <laughs> but um, but so they had. So they had a. a you know the, the the what we call a custom chip is a full custom chip. The typical one. That means that's a that's a that means that there's a there's a custom layout. There's they're they're designing things at the transistor level, and that's that's not what this is. This is where you basically just design the logic, and it goes into a standard chip. It's like it's like a big programmable chip, only it's not programmable. They could crank one out in a month, which was kind of nice because most companies can't give you a new gate array in a month, and you could do. You could do fairly good stuff. We were running at 25 megahertz, which is about the most that these things could handle, and you had to be pretty ca careful about them. Not just they weren't just they weren't that fast, but it, it worked. It worked. Um, what were the chip guys? Were there chip guys still, or were they? No, there were still chip guys. Chip guys. The chip guys were actually working on some future stuff. They really didn't do for the Amiga 3000. The chip guys gave us a version. I sat down with George and the chip, some of the chip guys, Bob Rabel, and we. We kind of, I kind of told them how I wanted the memory, you know, how I wanted stuff to go. Oh, Greg Berlin was there too, and we decided kind of on how we were going to architect this. Because the thing about the Amiga 3000 is we were still using the 16-bit chips, but we wanted to have a 32-bit chip bus. So we had to make sure that that would work pretty well. Um, so when when Agnes hits the memory, it acts like 16. When 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 the uh, when the A3000 talks to chip memory, it hits, it acts like 32-bit, and it that worked. It was it was. Um, it, it was good. Um, so um, we also, we, of course, we also had Unix. The Unix guys were still around. Um, not Ray, uh, not, um, not Bob Wellen anymore, but um, uh, Johan George and Rico Tudor um, were, were um, porting Unix. And in fact, we had the, we had, we were now actually call, allowed to call it Amiga Unix because it was, uh, it was the, uh, the, when, when they changed, they changed the, they made agreements with Sun and they started trying to, trying to make Unix more of a one thing and not just like everybody's special own little Unix. Um, kind of ironic that that didn't work, but... Um, so anyway, um, we, we, we were presenting the... Uh, in in uh, 1990, in April, we, were, we had this big thing in New York City to present the Amiga 3000 to the world. And we did. It was at the thing was called a place called the Palladium or something like that. It was a, it was a, it was a really cool show. Biggest, biggest debut for a machine I'd ever been at. I wasn't at the Amiga 1000 debut. I hadn't been doing anything for Amiga 1000. So um, this was April of 1990. Um, and actually, the, the thing was the hardware had been done for a pretty long time. We were, we were still making some last minute revisions. I'd run into a situation where my buster chip wouldn't work with the, with the bridge card. Our, our boss, Vice President of Engineering, Henry Rubin, had really pushed this bridge card, the thing that lets you run IBM PC programs. And it had been designed in Germany. And um, I remember specifically this, this one day where, okay, the bridge card wasn't working with the new buster chip. And Henry Rubin was all, oh, he was very, very panicky. And he called, he summoned the Germans. I was like, give, give me a day. Because the chip had just come in that day. He's like, give me a day. He's like, he's like um, 
that's, uh, no, I'm, I'm summoning the Germans. And I had to go, I think, oh, I remember, I had to go and get a root canal that, that day. So I couldn't stick around. The Germans weren't even going to get there until, you know, until later. And um, I, I, had to, I had to go and get a root canal. So I went and got the root canal. But while I was driving there, I realized what the problem was. <laughs> I was, you know, I'm driving down, I, I had a stupid Fiero at the time, I was going like 90 miles an hour down the highway, and I'm, I'm thinking about it, and all of a sudden, like, I know what the problem is. So I went and got my root canal. I came back. Germans had apparently arrived. They saw that nothing was going and went out to dinner. <laughs> and I wasn't there, of course. So I'm, I'm there at like 9 o'clock at night, and I, I, I made this little fix to, I think I put it on, I think actually I put it on the back plane of the, of the Amiga 3000, the riser card. And the problem was that the, it was the ready signal versus the, uh, versus the OVR signal. It was the way you control DTAC. And um, the buster chip was doing something that, that they hadn't thought of. And I'm not sure, you could argue either way, whether I was wrong or they were wrong. But it was something that clearly had to be fixed in the buster chip. But, so I, I fixed the back plane. And then, I, then immediately, bridge card came up, it was running, and MS-DOS. And I put a little shell script in there. It just looped or looped and said, you know, and said something, I don't know, something pithy. And then uh, I went home. Now these guys had no idea I had even been there, so they get back from dinner and, or whatever. I don't know when they came in next. I didn't come in the next day. I was really beat, and it was just working. And like they, they had no idea why it, why it had started working. So that was uh, that that was that was kind of the way things. You know, I, I always like doing things like that because they you know it's a mysterious man comes in and fixes things. <laughs> so um, would you rather have had a root canal or meet with the Germans? Uh, the root canal, yeah. The root canal was actually, especially the Germans who were working on the bridge card. It was just, you know, I, I mean, because I was again, I was, I didn't like the idea of the bridge card because it was kind of stupid to run IBM stuff when you had an Amiga, but that was just me. So anyway, the one, the so, so we're debuting the Amiga three three thousand. The one thing almost nobody knew about was six months before that or so, we had hired this guy Scott Schaefer. Now, the Amiga, the 68,030, of course, was in the Amiga 3000. That, that had been around for a couple of years, right? Because I, you know, I'd gotten one in 87 or 88 when they first came out and made the, made the 2630. Well, the thing is, the 68,040 had been announced. It was coming out. The, almost nobody had one, but we hired Scott Schaefer to make us a 68,040 board because I'd been busy on other stuff, and I've been usually the guy who did CPU boards, right? But it, he actually had 68,040 experience already. We had a kick-ass 68,040 board at the Amiga 3000 debut in 1990. It had, a, had like 128K L2 cache on it, or was it 256? I don't know. It was a big-ass L2 cache on it. And, um, and, and it was a very, very expensive thing to make, but it was, it was super high power. And we, we told Motorola that we, we had this and we wanted to show it at the at the thing, and they were like, we have to get special permission. We can't, we can't let you show that, because no one had ever shown a 68,040 in public before. And they not only got a special permission, they, they had a courier take a golden 68,040 chip for us to show off, because they were all worried about some of the errors they knew about, none of which mattered to Amigo OS anyway. Um, or, we, or, they, or our guys had programmed around them or whatever. I mean, they tended to do that. We, were, we worked at Commodore. You never really expected your chips to work right anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, so we, uh, we, we did this thing, we, we had this there, and our bosses at the last minute said, no, we're not going to show it. So it was, you know, big, you know, you had this balloon, it was finally ready, and then, you know, they let all the air out. Um, so, yeah, that, that kind of sucked. But um, who, who was it that said you couldn't show it? I don't even remember. I think it came, it, it came from Henry, but I'm not sure who made the final decision. Wow. Like Marshall Smith, was he still there? No. Okay. No. You know, and no one was around to punch him, so. <laughs> That's only a rumor. <laughs> okay, so after, okay, the last, the last bit of the Amiga 3000 era, era was about a year, about a year later, um, 1991, the Amiga 1000 T came out. That was mostly Scott Schaefer and, and, and Greg Berlin working on that. Um, and that was the tower version. And the main thing there was we were trying to start to get to more standard parts. So they were using a, a more standard power supply in there, something that was more PC-ish, and, and it, part of the problem was, you know, we just, we, to make Amigas cheaper, we didn't want to keep reinventing wheels that were already pretty good. We just wanted to concentrate on stuff that only we could do. So that was, that was kind of, that was really the impact of the Amiga 3000 as far as I, T, as far as I was concerned, is that it was just making, it was, it was going to make things a little more standardized. Um, so, 
at the same time as the Amiga 3000 was, was coming out, the chip guys were working on, okay, so there was, you know, everyone's like, what are these chip guys doing? Well, in 1988, they started on this project called the Advanced Amiga Architecture, or AAA. Um, that was a really long multi-year project, project that was building us a 64-bit graphics chipset. And it was taking a long time. And of course, Commodore wasn't spending enough money on engineering. And the most expensive thing you can spend money on is chip design. So um, that was not going really fast. In between that, George Robbins had been talking to um, Bob Rabel, another chip designer. And they had come up with this thing called that was originally called Pandora. And eventually got, after AAA, this became AA because it wasn't quite as big as AAA. I guess there, a AA didn't actually stand for anything. It was just one less than AAA. Um, I, they could have called it triple B, I don't know. But anyway, um, so double A, and um, I, I got involved because they needed somebody to build a computer that would take these chips. They were coming out in late 1990. So pretty much right after the Amiga 3000 was done, I started working on what I called the Amiga 3000 Plus. That was something I cooked up with Jeff Porter. Um, so it was going to take the, the, it was gonna take the double A chips, which really weren't hardware-wise. What I had to do, there was different stuff, but it wasn't it wasn't a wasn't crazy different. It, it had a 32-bit bus for video fetch, and it could do burst mode. It could run two cycles for every RAM cycle. You could get twice as much data. So it, you got four times, basically four times faster, but just for video modes. The the Alice chip was really just a revised version of Agnes. It wasn't going to be any, wasn't going to be doing anything, and we didn't have. Paulo was still Paulo. We didn't have. We didn't change anything there. Um, but it was. It was. It was going to give us 8-bit color. It's going to give us um, better graphics modes, and we really needed that sort of thing. And it was going to let us talk to VGA monitors without a flicker fixer. <laughs> so, um, and the, the but the the Amiga 3000 Plus. I was being a, I, I'd been a musician. I really didn't do much of that during Commodore, but um, I'd also been an audio guy, and I was just I just wanted better sound. So I like I was like you know I talked to Jeff. We we it turns out we we were we were approached by AT and T about this thing they had called DSP thirty two ten, which was a DSP chip, and you know Next had had a DSP chip in their system, but this one was different. This didn't sit with on a port with its own memory. This sat next to the CPU as a coprocessor and could access anywhere in memory that, that your that your 68000 could. So I looked at that and said, well, that looks good. And Jeff, Jeff was a communications guy. He, he was the, I think he had the, he, he had been working in Commodore for, he worked at Commodore and in about six months had come out with the 1200 baud modem. Um, really fast product delivery for a guy uh, just starting Commodore. So he was a communications guy. And guess what you could also do with the DSP? You could do modem stuff. and. That's kind of what we thought about it. Um, there was another thing that had, you know, that it, it's kind of sad to point out, but the DSP 3210 did did 32-bit floating point 10 times faster than the 68,040, which might have been useful to graphics people. I don't know, but you know, all these people rendering stuff on. Um, so Amiga 3000 Plus was also going to have an 040 in it. Um, so I I started working on this. I got the I had the DSP stuff going. Um, we had Randall Jessup. And a consultant from outside, Eric Levitsky, working on the 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 the, the AT and T chip actually had its own operating system. It was called VCOS, VCAS, and it was designed almost if you wanted to sit down and figure out how to put a, a DSP on the Amiga, and you knew everything about Amiga OS, nothing about anything else. This is pretty much what you would have come up with. It was perfect for us. Um, so we built this thing. I actually, Greg Berlin was redesigning the. Uh, the DMA chip at the time, the, the, the SCSI chip, the one that Jeff Boyer designed, because there were some issues and he wanted it to go faster, it didn't go fast enough. And um, so I got him to put some DSP control stuff in that chip just at the last minute. Unfortunately, just at the last minute meant that my stuff got connected to the wrong bus and it didn't work. So the prototypes, we only had a couple of Mega 3000 pro prototypes that worked with the DSP and they had all kinds of PALs and nasty wires around them, but they worked. And uh, Eric had one and Randall had one, I never got one. Um, but we, the DSP stuff worked. Um, there was there was a, there was a two different there were two different audio codecs on there. One was for hi-fi audio. One was for modems, and uh, the modem had to have some sort of phase correction stuff so the 9600 baud would work. And the, the real key was we went to AT&T, and AT&T didn't inter, even understand what we were going to do with this. They thought 
we're selling you a DSP chip and some software to replace a more expensive piece of hardware. We went there and told them, no, you're selling us this DSP chip to not replace anything, to sit next to our CPU, and we don't want to pay anything for the software. Of course. Um, well, we negotiated, and basically they were going to give us a bunch of math libraries so that people could write applications. And this thing multitasked, by the way. It didn't, you know, it was, it was different. It was multitasking for DSP is a little different, but it multitasked. It wasn't like the next chip at all. And um, we were going to get almost everything, including up to 2,400 baud modem in that package, and then we could sell other stuff. Other, they had some of their special sauce stuff they wanted us to pay more money for. So fine, those would be add-on software packages. Um, and this was going fine until, uh, and then there was, there, was one other, there was one other computer that we were working on. Um, there was this guy, a junior engineer, Joe Augenbraun, who, who had come up with this idea that, that everybody loved with, to finally get a mid-range computer going again. So we had A500, we had a3000, what goes in between? Well, there was room. There was room for something in between. So Joe had come up with this thing that we just started calling the, the A1000 Plus because it was going to be it's going to be a 68,020 processor. It was going to, this is in like 1991, 1992. It was going to run, um, it was going to have a, its own kind of CPU slot so you could expand a little bit. It was going to have a little bit of fast RAM built in. It was going to sell for under $1,000. Which, if you know, Mega two thousands were, you know, two or three thousand dollars. So it was it was good placement, and then, kind of all the shit hit the fan. Let's put it put it put it in in the proper terms. Um, the, uh, um, well, you know, our 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 chairman of the board, Irvin Gould, was never really happy with much anything Commodore ever did, other than pay him three million dollars a year. Um, so he went looking for people to blame and it was usually the marketing people and you know if they weren't selling enough that might mean something and you know it wasn't like they came to us and asked for hardware that we couldn't deliver we usually asked them what they wanted and when they had no idea we gave them something <laughs> so uh, um, they can't you know so so he came and basically replaced Henry Rubin as the head of engineering and with this guy Bill Sidney's and um, Jeff Porter was sort of pushed out of the way and they brought this other guy uh, Jeff Frank in to, uh, to uh, be the director of engineering and their mission for the first six months was pretty much to make the, make the, the, uh, the Henry Rubin, Jeff Porter uh, administration look bad. They didn't have really a whole lot of other plans other than there's this thing, there's this A600 concept. Okay, so after the A500, George Robbins was working on some additional, they had a couple versions of the A500. Eventually he decided he wanted to make something that was even cheaper. So he had come up with this idea of an A300. He had, he had this really brilliant hack, I don't remember how it worked, but it was gonna have a built-in Genlock, and it was gonna be, like, the Genlock was gonna cost almost nothing, and it was lower priced than the A500 because it was gonna have it didn't have built-in drive. You had to add on a drive, and you could. But by then, you you know, you'd have the option of adding on a hard drive or a floppy or both, or or a CD-ROM or whatever, because those things were all coming up. And um, they so they took the a they took this A300 design and started adding all kinds of crap to it, and eventually came up with the A500. That's why it had an e, it, that had the uh, the IDE slot or no the the uh, PCMCIA slot on it, a few other things. It was supposed that this project, whatever it was, was supposed to be five, up fifty or hundred dollars less than the Amiga five hundred. Turned out to cost hundred dollars more than the Amiga five hundred. And um, our our friend uh, Bill Sidney's not delivering was fired over this. the The biggest mistake they made at this time was that the Amiga five hundred was canceled, even though it was still selling really well. I mean, it wasn't the most current thing, but the problem was the Amiga six hundred didn't give you anything you didn't get with the Amiga 500, except that everything was soldered down inside so people couldn't hack it as easily. And everybody loved hacking Amiga 500s. You could, there was no, the CPU wasn't in a slot anymore, and it had this memory card add-on thing that nobody knew what to do with anyway, because there were no drivers, plus it didn't support the full PCM CIA that they wanted. So it was, it, it was kind of a boondoggle, in that they cut off this one machine that was selling really well and replaced it with something that nobody wanted. Uh, so, um, Okay, so the other thing that happened was now they needed, they, 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 they sort of liked the idea of this mid-range computer, but they didn't, um, I think Joe had already left by then um, after the, after the uh, A1000 Plus was, uh, 
was done. So they decided they were going to make a, a stripped down Amiga 3000. Um, Greg Berlin was, was responsible for this. Greg and Scott Schaefer were working on this. And um, they, it was dubbed the Amiga 2200 or something like that. We all called it the A1000 Junior. Because um, the thing about Bill Sidney is he had worked at IBM and he was the guy responsible for the IBM PC Junior, <laughs> which at the time had been their greatest failure in like the entire history of IBM. Um, I'm not sure they had a better one after that, but that, up to that point, that had been their greatest failure. So, so everyone called it the IBM PC Junior, which I'm sure just rubbed him the wrong way. But um, I mean, we call it, excuse me, we call it the A1000 Junior. Um, so there's this weird thing about Commodore. So this was actually built, and there's this weird thing about Commodore that um, it's the, the, they, the sales companies decide what they're going to sell all throughout the world. And if they don't order something, it basically doesn't get made. And not a single one of them ordered a, a, an Amiga 1000 Junior, or 2200, whatever you want to call it. Um, there was a big brother to that called the 3400 that had the regular configuration of the Amiga 1000. It was, I mean, Amiga 3000. It was in a different case. I don't even really know what it was for, other than it was basically an Amiga 3000 with the SCSI taken out. Um, Wasn't there a memo or something that said the next person that calls it the Amiga Junior is fired? I don't, uh, there might have been, I never pay attention to that stuff, but, <laughs> but um, there might have been. Um, so anyway, uh, actually I have it written down here, Amiga 1000 plus plus stupid equals Amiga 1000 Junior. Amiga 300, Amiga 300 plus plus stupid equals Amiga 600. Um, I just, that was my notes. Um, so, so, so actually what happened was, so, so um, the, 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 the A3000 plus, some of the A3000 plus stuff was in, was in all the, was, was going into, now that they realized that nobody wanted another ECS machine, which is what the, what the uh, junior was, um, the, the, the double A, the A3000, A3400, whatever they're going to call it, um, got double A and became the A4000. Um, while G Greg was working on these lesser machines, he told Scott Schaefer, build us the cheapest A 040 card known to mankind, because he's like, we can't, re we really can't release another A 030 based computer. So he was at least going to have an upgrade in, in mind that didn't, that didn't cost a mint like this really good card that we made. So they built that module, and that's that, those two pieces, the upgraded four slot machine, the, the upgrade was adding Zorro 3 and a few other things that made it a little bit more like an A3000. And then that 040 card, and it had the double A chips and all that, and that became the, uh, that became the Amiga 4000. And um, so, to put it in perspective, the, the A3000 Plus first booted in graphics, with graphics working and everything, in February of 1991. We were hoping to ship it probably within a year. Um, the actual shipping of the Amiga, 3, Amiga 4000 was fall of 92 because of all this delaying and screwing around with things that nobody wanted and everyone in engineering knew that nobody wanted. Even the people working on it knew they didn't want it. Uh, they did their best, but you know, you, you, if, if you're making the wrong thing. You're just making the wrong thing. Um, the one good thing that was happening at the time was, was uh, George Robbins, Brian Fenimore, and some other guys were working on the Amiga 1200 and mostly because for whatever reason management had been concentrating so much on doing the, uh, do, doing the high end machine wrong, they weren't paying too much attention to the low end machine. So that was done pretty good. The 1200 was a great design. They actually did a whole gate array gale that did kind of everything you needed to do. It was, it was what Gary did, only it was more so because they, they, were, they were actually allowed to do it outside of the company and they had a bigger package. Um, so, that, so these both came out in 1992. Um, There's some other stuff that was going on in the Amiga world and everything. Um, so, in, uh, in 1990, this little thing called the Video Toaster came out. And it actually came out for the Amiga, for, for the Amiga 2000, because nobody, of course, knew that the Amiga 3000 was coming, and you could kind of squeeze one into Amiga 3000. It, it didn't always work that well. But the Video Toaster was just, was really starting to revolutionize video, and if you looked at, um, if you looked at um, you know, almost any cable network, if, you know, you start seeing this stuff show up on, um, you start to see, you know, Amigas were using, being used everywhere, but they were starting to start to not look like Amigas because of the Amiga, because the video toaster was making things look very professional. If you look at anybody in this room with a camera that costs more than $4,000, they were probably Amiga toaster users at some point. <laughs> um, and maybe even some of the others. And 
the Amiga toaster also, I mean, the, you know, the video toaster also, um, also delivered uh, in 1993 Babylon 5, which debuted with 20 minutes of CGI in, in, in an era when nobody did much CGI for television. And the other one, uh, actually the same year, was Sequest DSV. Those were both created because there was an Amiga that could do that sort of thing. Um, so video was, things were actually picking up. Video was becoming this really critical thing that Amigas did that nobody else did. Um, so, you know, the Amiga 4000 stuff didn't change a whole lot of that. People like the Amiga 4000 over the 3000 because it rendered stuff a whole lot faster because of the 040 in it. And they didn't really, the architecture wasn't what I wanted, but they didn't care that much because when you're, when you're doing rendering, it's almost all the CPU and the I.O. and stuff didn't matter that much anyway. Um, but I was looking for the next thing. So in, in 1991, I started designing what probably would have been the A4, A5000 system architecture. It was something I called a cruciator. And it was, um, I had come up with a bus that was uh, sort of a, a independent, processor independent bus that was going to connect all these modules together. And then in 1992, I mean, this was just stuff I started designing. I didn't actually write circuits. I was designing the whole architecture first while I had some time waiting for all this stuff to settle out about the Amiga 3000. Um, plus, all, what we were going to do with AA, there was just a lot of downtime while they were delaying things. So I was working on the next thing, figuring out, you know, I got to do something. And uh, then PCI came along solving exactly that same problem. So Amy Bus went out the door and PCI came in and replaced it. Um, Let's see, I had also designed um, a, uh, because of the A4000 not having really fast uh, SCSI, I designed, an A4, uh, I designed a Zora 3 thing called the A4091 that had the best SCSI chip we had ever used on it. And we, we actually licensed that out for somebody else to make because it, Commodore wasn't doing so well and um, we, were, we were a little concerned about um, biting off more than we could chew anyway. So I just designed that and we were able to license that out to a third party who made it and it was the fastest SCSI we had until the other thing that came out a little bit later was the Amiga 4000T, which was an Amiga 4000 with that SCSI chip in it, a few other corrections, two video slots, a few other cool things, but they're only, they, the Commodore's in such bad shape by then, that was 93, that things were really, they just couldn't make many of them. It's kind of a collector's item, I think, these days, but that was the best SCSI we'd ever had in a system. Um, let's see, uh, okay, um, I, there, was, there was this, remember I mentioned in 1988, there was this, this thing called, uh, called AAA that was working, or that was work, started working on. Well, in about 93 or so, they were actually getting chips back. So they, they contacted me again and said, you gotta, make, you gotta make a board for these. So I, um, I created a, a motherboard using a, A3000 parts and a whole lot of really fast PALs. Um, that was called Nix, and um, so it had it could it could support either a 32-bit or 64-bit AAA system. AAA could give you graphics up to 1280 by 800, something like that, in various different color modes. We had it had crazy amounts of color modes. It had it had some compressed modes that would be, that would essentially expand kind of like some of the early video compression only in hardware it had full frame full line buffering for every line so it could support three different pixels four different pixel clocks at the same time so you could do the pulling up and down of screens it had 32 bit co copper a 32 bit blitter um, it had it had four operands some four operand operations with blitter i don't remember what it did it's a lot of stuff it did it was pretty amazing um it didn't work <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, it was, we had first rev chips, we put them into this system that was highly hackable, so I could basically reprogram almost anything to make it work. Only thing I couldn't do was the original Andrea chip didn't have a bus that turned off properly. Um, we really couldn't fix that. We did get graphics out of it with some peaking, some clever stuff. We had a couple, um, they found a couple errors in the chips and there's this process called fibbing, focused ion beaming, where you're basically making edits to an existing chip. It cost about $1,000 per chip. So they, they fibbed a couple of the parts to, to do what we wanted them to do well enough to actually get images out. Um, there was something wrong with the color lookup table, so you actually had to do a mathematical transform on your RGB to, to then put that in. I mean, it was, it was exactly what you'd expect for a very first rev of the chip. Only problem is that was also the last one that was ever going to happen. It was pretty clear by then. Um, so that's one of the other things that just never, you know, kind of 
Great idea. It was too late. It should have been. It should have been two years earlier. If that came out in ninety nine two, it would have been the best graphics on any machine that you could call a personal computer. Um, let's see. There's a few other ones here. Um, CD thirty two came out in nineteen ninety three as well. That was basically an A twelve hundred scaled down to be a game machine. That was really well done too. It was. They, it was. They. They. Had, they had actually integrated the eighty five twenties into a custom chip. Um, they, it was a neat process. They, they do, a lot of people do that now, but they were one of the first ones to get a really, really, really expensive FPGA, like maybe 500,000 bucks, and put the whole 8520 design into that. And then they took out the parts they didn't need for the C32, CD32, built that as a, as a register, you know, as, as a high-level language model, and then moved that over to the, uh, to the custom chip, and it worked. Um, and that was... That was pretty much the, that was the last act in 1993 into 1994. Um, CD32 was a popular idea. Commodore had, was in such debt that they were paying cash pretty much for anything because they owed people so much money that they couldn't get any parts unless they paid cash. And of course they weren't getting parts at really good prices because most of the people who were smart enough to, um, you know, to, to see all the bills Commodore hadn't paid, weren't, you know, weren't even interested in talking to them. So the, uh, the CD32 orders, the A1200 orders, were, were, were like many, many times what they were actually able to make. And of course, the whole thing came crashing down in the spring of 94. Um, and there's, there's, somebody made a film about that. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's pretty much, that's the end of Commodore. I mean, I didn't want to dwell too much on the, on the things coming down. But um, you know, we had you know, Amiga OS uh, 3.0 was was out for the Amiga 4000. They were they were working towards retardable graphics that was you know going to let you run graphics on any graphics card as part of the operating system. Um, that that was another thing that that Commodore hadn't spent enough time and money to make that happen early enough. That that was another thing that was going to make things. I was I was actually the very very last few days I was working on a on a thing that was going to, I was working with a company, actually a local company in Pennsylvania called Sang Labs that made a, uh, one of the early VGA, better than VGA, VGA chips. And they had some unique properties, properties to there. They had a really, really fast PCI bus interface. Um, so I was going to be able to basically use that as either a graphics chip or a flicker fixer. With, with a, I had a, I had a, a PL, PLD design that was going to, is going to basically allow that thing to act as a flicker fixer, take video directly into it, but also turn it into a frame buffer and, and a smart thing. Once once retardable graphics were working, that was another thing that you know there just wasn't enough time to finish. So um, that, that's that's pretty much it. That's that's the uh, the last few years of Commodore, and uh, that was the last last nine years. I mean, we were, you know it, some people thought that you know that after after the 8-bit stuff, Commodore's really headed downhill. But for a long time, there was an upward trajectory. We were, you know, we were getting into things. You know, the gaming in Europe and the, uh, the video in, in the U.S. were, were uh, really taking it in new directions. And you know, anytime we came out with a new model of the high-end stuff, we, the same people went and bought the same one. So we had a guaranteed you know, 150, 200,000 unit sales right off the bat and the Amigas in Europe were selling, you know, in, I think they sold one and a half million at the peak in one year. So, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like they weren't trying. I mean, you know, it's just, you, you, have to, you have to spend money and put it in to, to keep things going and otherwise you fall behind no matter how diligent your engineers are because, you know, we, you know, we work in adrenaline and coffee and stuff, but um, we can't, you know, some things actually have to be paid for. I can't just produce, I can't 3D print my chips. If I could, maybe Commodore would still be around. But anyway, that's, that's all I got to say about that. Was the, oh, the, C6, okay. the Commodore 65 was, I mean, that fitted in somewhere in that time frame as well? There's one in every crowd. Uh, we don't yeah. talk about <laughs> it. In, don't we? Nobody understands why there was a Commodore 65, <laughs> other than there was a guy nobody wanted to work with, and they kind of let him do whatever they wanted, whatever, whatever he wanted to do in order to not have to work with him. There was absolutely no possible reason on this planet why there should have been a Commodore 65. Yeah. <laughs> I, I heard that Apple invented the home computer. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's false information. <laughs> so I yeah. was wondering, while well, you guys are doing 1,000s and 500 pluses and 3,000s and dithering this and all that, yeah. what was Apple doing? Apple actually, a Apple was making Macintoshes. Apple, Apple was the actual, actually Apple was the big beneficiary of the whole thing we did with AT&T. Because even though the Amiga 3000 Plus didn't work, 
it didn't get finished, didn't go out with the DSP in it. A year later, Apple went to AT&T asking about DSP chips. And AT&T, because me and Jeff went to, went to uh, AT&T in Allentown and told them how they had to sell this to us, um, it was all set when Apple got there. AT and T already, you know, they had already been schooled. They, they are, you know, I'm sure they charged Apple more than they charged us. They probably got ten dollars a copy for that math library, but they, they were already, they were already being told, um, you know, they had already learned how how to sell this stuff. So Apple got that, and um, Apple, they even came out years after the Amiga three thousand. They even came out with an okay. 68,030 line uh, product called the uh, the Apple the Mac 2 FX. The only problem was none of the good stuff ran under uh, Mac OS. You had to go to Unix to use the DMA for hard disks and things like that. So Apple was still way behind. The uh, they, they got they got fairly good hardware about the time they switched over to x86 mainly because they weren't really designing anything anymore. It was just an off the shelf Intel chipset. Dave, what was your opinion of the CDTV and Carl Sassenrat? Carl, Carl's a, Carl, Carl's another one of those mad wizards. I, I have a lot of respect for Carl. Uh, and and CDT, the CDTV was a good idea. Um, it, you know, I actually probably should have put that in there too. But CD, CDTV was you know, that came out in 99, 1990 or so. The CDTV was um, it was actually the, the thing I liked best about it was it really pissed off Philips because they had been promising this thing called called CDI for years and not delivering it and like in you know in, in one stroke we beat them to it even though they had they had been designing it for years. Um, I thought it was a great idea. Um, they did it right. A lot of the things that you want in a personal computer you have to do different for a living room appliance. And even back even back in the Commodore days we had we had poked around the idea of we had a lot of really good ideas. We you know we had this. Um, this guy Terry Ryan had a thing called the PIM, which was a kind of a little bit like one of these, only with a CD um, that you'd carry around and have all your information with you. And we had a uh, we had some ideas for living room computers, but we didn't we could never quite figure out exactly what to do with a living room computer. But you know, I mean, the living room computer became a big thing because that's all your game machines now, really, just living room computers. I did some living room computers at, at companies later on. And, but the CD32, CDTV rather, CDTV, CDTV Plus, um, that was kind of the first living room computer. That was a real full-fledged computer that you thought was an entertainment appliance. So it was, it was a great idea. Right. Time. <laughs> Jeff, do you have a question? Uh, Uh, who cares what's going on at Atari? <laughs> um, actually, the interesting thing about Atari was that the that the um, the Atari ST was an awful lot like Rev Two of the Z8000 machine, and uh, it's hard to imagine how that could have happened. The interesting thing, of course, was that the Rev that the Rev Two of the Z8000 machine didn't work. Well, we, we couldn't <laughs> prove that it looked like it because they shredded the schematics before they left, so we actually didn't know what a Rev Two looked like by that. Time. So they copied something that didn't work. Well, they got it to work, but I mean, they, they basically walked out of the door with a particular <coughs> architecture that just yeah. showed up, just magically showed up later with the 68,000 in it. You can't really prove that that happened, but everyone knows it did. <laughs> All, right. All right, thank you, Dave. Good job, man. All right. Thanks. Um, thank you, Dave. That was awesome. We now have a whole history of Commodore. <laughs>